My name is Josh. I'm speaking to you from PAC Studios in South Bend, Indiana, the host of We the Peace. We the Peace is a podcast sponsored by PAX, dedicated to mobilizing Christian leaders to bring Jesus-centered peacemaking and justice into our organizations. We explore how peacemaking, activism, and the justice of Jesus are central to discipleship. We the church are we the peace in a hurting and violent world. In this inaugural season, I will be laying the foundation for We The Peace. The first episode is about yours truly. I wanna give you some context to who I am. In the second episode, I'll explain why you should care to begin with. I don't want you to waste your time, so I'll be explicit about the need for a show like this one. In the third episode, I'll be talking about who the show is for, fourth, and the final episode of the mini series that is season one is gonna go over the format and flow of the show. I'm gonna let you know what to expect when you watch or listen. Then season two of We The Peace is called Jesus Centered Politics. Let's jump in. What's up everyone? My name is Josh Buck. This is the inaugural season of We The Peace. In this episode, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about myself, which makes me uncomfortable, but I'm doing this for a few reasons. One, it's important for me to talk about family of origin, faith, you know, whatever, credentials, things I've done, my struggles, all of that, because we can't keep our culture and even our social location out of what we're doing and what we're presenting. And I don't wanna act like I can do that. So I wanna talk about a little bit Uh, where I'm coming from. Number two, I was having a conversation with a friend on the team arguing that I shouldn't have an episode about myself. And and he was like, listen, we at PAX are trying to create embodied expressions of faith and you're bringing this into what you're doing, so you should do it. So on the uh, advice of counsel, (laughs) I'm also doing this. Um, So I'm gonna go back quite a ways. Buck family, my last name is Buck, B-U-C-K. 1635. All right. Long time ago, uh, William Buck, my 10th great grandfather, uh, went from the Netherlands to England and then migrated to the, quote, new world. Not that new. A part of the great migration of 1635, 12 weeks on a boat, got to the shore, ended up in a colony from Bucksport, Maine, up in Maine, which was an outpost of the Revolutionary War down through Arkansas, Tennessee, ended up in Texas, which is where I was born. Listen, my ancestors, the Bucks, especially blue collar, hardworking, stubborn, kind hearted farmers, pool hall owners, entrepreneurs, oil field workers, and fighters from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War fighting for the Confederacy. I am a son of the Confederacy to uh, World War I and World War II. Two, definitely a legacy of engaging in national violence. The Brake family, which is my mom's side, comes from really strong Southern Baptist roots. My great grandfather on my mom's side was a traveling evangelist and preacher in the South, and I actually have his Bible today. And um, it's very special having that in our family. I grew up in Reformed-ish churches. We moved from the uh, South, specifically Dallas, Texas area, Garland, to the Northwest outside of Seattle where it rains all the time and constantly, but it's beautiful, but it's depressing. And I grew up there and I was a part of a church for a lot of my spiritual formation years that was planted out of the Billy Graham crusade. I gave my life to Jesus at the age of 18. And at that point, I was like, I'm going to base my entire life off of Jesus and the Bible. I need to get to know Jesus, and I should probably get to know the Bible. And I moved to Los Angeles to be a part of a Bible college that was getting off the ground, Eternity Bible College. And I was very impacted by my experience there. Eternity Bible College gave me a decent command of the Bible, a care for God's word, and really brought us into the narrative of scripture and said, you are a part of this beautiful story that includes 
this vehicle called the church that Jesus was crucified and resurrected to get off the ground, this organization, this community of people to help bring love and light and generosity and, and the brilliance of God to the world to help people become more like Jesus. So at, at that point, I was being very impacted by that. I learned what it meant to be a pastor for the first time. And I also was developing a huge heart for the world. This was when Francis Chan, the church that I was attending and worked at, was on a big kick, like radical Christianity is normal Christianity. That was like a part of what he was saying, which I was very much a part of that. But second was uh, to be a Christian is to have a heart for the nations and the world and to care about those all over the world. So through traveling and going overseas and, and teaching some, I learned enough to realize I'm not cultured. I learned enough to realize I'm super white. I learned enough to realize I have so much learning to do. And it was during those travels and living in different places overseas as well that I got to see firsthand the impact of a Christianity that was inside of colonialism given to these nations given to these uh, uh, tribes, given to these people groups, and they were still suffering from a white warrior, reformed, racialized Jesus Christ. And what does it look like to decouple colonialism from Christianity and also seeing firsthand how violence can totally destroy churches and communities. I'm not just talking about killing, but the the surrendering of the church to violent modes, violent ways of behaving as if we can kick Jesus to the curb when he decided to talk about nonviolence. So coming back to the States as a 22-year-old, having just taught at a university in Africa, I was really coming into my own, I would say, theologically in my understanding of a, a Christocentric reading and version of the Bible, not dismissing the Sermon on the Mount and the Gospels as something that we shouldn't take into our lives, and really coming from that Reformed setting, looking at how colonialism was connected to that. More on that later. I come back to the States, I meet my wife. I'll talk about her in a second. But first, where do I fit into the Christian landscape? Because I largely fit into where I did when I came back from traveling, came back to the States, was a youth pastor up in Camarillo, then moved to Los Angeles to, to church plant. Listen, I'm majority culture. I'm a white, straight male. I am neo-Anabaptist in my Anglo-theological orientation. What that means is if I had to pick a group of white folks throughout church history that I would say most closely identifies with the, the meaning of the gospel, the message of Jesus, and the, the mode or the way in which the church is supposed to be, I got to put my flag down and, with the Anabaptists. These are people out of the Reformation that were trying to recover, really, the vision of the early church to live simply, to, to uh, press into the priesthood of all believers. In other words, everybody in the Christian community brings something to the table, and a rejection of structure, uh, powers of structure within Catholicism and within the Reformed Protestant churches that were just kind of getting their uh, movement off the ground to say, we believe in the empowerment of people on the ground, especially those who suffer from those who are in power. And I really see the, the Anabaptist vision, or a neo-Anabaptist, in other words, and some improvements have been made along the way, vision connecting really strongly back to the four Gospels, to Jesus, to the prophetic witness of the Old Testament, and to what we see in all the epistles moving forward into Revelation. I find myself in the prophetic witness tradition. Now, this is a theological tradition that was born out of people who suffer. In Latin America, uh, the African-American community within their theologies, and the Asian-American theologies that have been created in and from the margins to say, when you follow Jesus— you have a deep care and compassion for those who suffer. In fact, as we read Jesus, we discover that this is his very central message. 
connected back to the Old Testament. Now, why, especially as a white dude, do I have an affinity for the prophetic witness tradition? Well, when you get to know Jesus and you read the New Testament, you find out very quickly that the prophetic witness theological tradition squares very closely with the Jewish tradition in the Old Testament, the Jewish tradition as it manifested in the the body, the life, the ministry, the love of Jesus in the New Testament, and the movement that was started out of the ashes of Jesus' crucifixion and the hope of resurrection, this early church being pressed down by the Roman government, by tyrannical leaders, and the church being born into this beautiful, beautiful flower that is growing out of very hard soil. Now, there's a lot of problems in the early church and a lot of bad things that happened, but there was a turning point in church history around Constantine uh, that was justified philosophically by Augustine that we suffer from in North American Christianity. And I'll, I'll, I'll speak more to that in future episodes. Even more broadly, I am a grandson of modernity. That means I was not born of modernity. The modern age ended around World War II. But I really have some modernist leanings because we just came out of this era and, and so that means I do believe in one truth. I believe in absolute truth. I believe that you can't look at eight religions and say they're all spokes to the same, they're all spokes on the same wheel leading to the same middle. Uh, I think things need to be logically thought out. I think things need to make sense. And uh, sometimes there is black and white, sometimes. But listen, I am a son of post-modernity. That means I do not mind living in gray. I do not mind not having all the answers about God, about theology, about my life. It means also, as a son of post-modernity, I come to institutions of power with a deep suspicion, or what some theologians call a hermeneutic of suspicion, that when people are making truth claims and when people are promoting their truth and evangelizing their truth, which can be okay, I am suspicious of what that does to people who suffer. So you're promoting this person, this policy, this situation, this religion, this gospel, but as people adopt this, what does it do to people who suffer the most? Because we have seen in the modern age a a critical and massive and unbelievable overreach of colonial power, which still affects North American Christianity in major, major ways. I planted a church in Los Angeles and had to move away because of some health issues. Been a pastor for for, uh, about 12 years, a professor at a university in Africa, another one in California. I like to teach, and I also, uh, in my heart, which this is very, um, it's in my blood from the books, but I'm an entrepreneur, and I definitely inherited that from my mom and my dad. And really seeing right now the evangelical landscape erode the witness of the church. That's why this podcast exists, because I care about the church, I care about leaders, and it's being carried away into the latest progressive agenda that's being created by the academy or some elites And Jesus is really fashioned into the latest progressive vision of society, which I'm like, well, that's silly because there's a historical Jesus for us to follow. But then I see on the other side, churches and Christians and, and politicians doubling down on civil religion, Republican, single party voter nonsense. Those that believe that we have no progress to be made and we really need to get back to some weird, awkward, silly, evil, sinful, utopian society that never existed. And I see both of these camps carrying the heart of the evangelical church away into negative directions and carrying the global church largely because this whole conversation is dominated by white people. So what does it mean 
to re recover the Jewish Jesus? How do we Western majority culture Christians like myself rediscover the Eastern faith tradition of Christianity? How can we decouple violence, colonialism, best business practices, and sinful Western values from Jesus? These are many of the questions I am interested in answering now. Now, why ask such provocative questions? It's simple. The witness of the church is at stake. If the church is being carried away into the latest progressive vision or make America great white Jesus on the wrapped in the flag on the crop, what? No, we can't be carried away into these false ideas of who Jesus is. We have to get back to the historical Jesus, the biblical Jesus, and that is difficult. And as I'm going to be talking about in the next episode, we are at a crisis point in North America in relation to church, pastoral leadership, and our theological institutions are at a massive crossroads. And my heart is for churches to thrive and for pastors to be loved and equipped to do ministry different, to be different, and to press into the new creation that Jesus has for us. I want us to be empowered to follow the historic Middle Eastern, Palestinian, radical, politically charged, anti-business practice, decolonial, personal Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can be the peace in the 21st century. Some credentials. I have a bachelor's in biblical studies, MA in ministry, and I'm working on a PhD in intercultural studies, and I'm buried up in that right now. I work for an organization called PAX. You can learn more at madeforpax.org, and PAX is sponsoring this podcast. Some struggles that I have. I could literally talk for 30 minutes, but I will keep it brief. I honestly think I'm more broken than most people. I feel like I'm more stubborn than most people. I feel like uh, I'm not as good as I should be as a Christian. That's kind of the way I enter the day feeling this brokenness. I don't enter the day with this optimism and confidence that I'm the best. It's more like, no, what can I actually do to make the day better? And how can I help change the world? Because I am broken. And a big part of that is more recent. I'm 34, but I've struggled with chronic asthma my whole life. But when I hit the age of 30 in Los Angeles, I realized after, you know, running into a concrete wall 30 times and going, God, ow, I'm hurting. And, and God's like, you're running into a wall. And I'm like, I am. And God's like, yeah, you're running into a wall. You know, I've always treated my body like a car. And I mean that in the worst possible way. I kind of use, and I'm not talking about like the, the people who love their vehicles. I don't get that. I'm talking about the people who just kind of use their vehicles to get from point A to point B. You put gas in it when you need, and when something bad happens, you reluctantly and in a really frustrated way, like the car owes you something, you take it to get fixed. And that's how I've treated my body, and I've learned to ignore my health issues, huge allergy issues and asthma issues, and I struggle from insomnia. And these are three circles that overlap and jack each other up on a regular basis. And it, it impacts so much, my health, my mood, um, uh, uh, as I try to relate to God and being like Jesus and, and my sinfulness and my, and my attitude. And I don't know how to listen to my body. And that's a way that I'm really broken. And I'm trying to develop that skill and failing at it and moving out of Los Angeles. Um, we, we would have had to leave regardless of whether I... I knew how to listen to my body or not because it was just untenable to be there with the smog and the eternal summer without clearing out the skies. But so much of my failures are attached to not being aware of my body and functioning as a Gnostic, acting like my body is a tool to be used and, and, and 
moving through the world with a very disembodied experience, like literally being in fight or flight on a daily basis when I'm working, which is super unhealthy. So with that and insomnia, which is a big challenge and discouragement of mine, and then allergy issues, currently getting a bunch of allergy shots, and then a bunch of just stuff I deal with as a Christian and trying to be like Jesus and sinfulness, you know, you throw that all together, um, that's me and that's the brokenness I bring to this. And my natural mood is melancholy. My natural mood during the day is the world is heavy. There is a lot of suffering and like we're all on our phones and we're watching Netflix at night and a child dies every three to four seconds of malnutrition. And what in the world are we doing to actually make a difference? And so that's where I am on a daily basis. And then with the health challenges, trying to shut off my mind, trying to have joy in the day, have hope in the day. And God is, I got no complaints. The people that God has brought around me throughout my life and the love that people have shared, I have not had a hard life. And I'm thankful for it. And, and this is so much about who I am. And then the most important people in my life, my wife and my three kiddos, my wife, Saraswati Rampersad Buck, throw that white Netherlands name on the end of that beautiful name. <laughs> Sorry, babe. Um, she was born in Guyana and in the midst of racial strife that was being provoked through CIA engagement in the Cold War era nonsense that we were engaged in caused much suffering for my wife's family. And during the brain drain of post-independence Guyana, her father brought them from Guyana to Jamaica. And that is where my wife grew up, in the middle of Jamaica on an estate called Worthy Park. And when she was a teenager, she was sent to the States for a better education. When she was 22, I was 22. I had just gotten back from Africa and figuring out becoming a youth pastor at a church in Camarillo. And uh, she a nurse figuring out next steps in her life. I met her and I was like, whatever I got to do, this woman is amazing. And she's been a huge leader and impactful person in my life. I, I, can't, I can't say enough about how big of an impact she's had in my life. And then we got three really dope kids. Uh, Ahana, Anaya, and Azariah, 10, 9, and 5. And if you have kids, you know you could talk about your kids for hours, so I won't do that. But that's a little bit about me, and I want to say this, and I'll be done with this week's episode. Why in the world did I talk about myself for 20 minutes? I feel we're doing it, but something super important, this is leadership lesson number one, a leader, and especially a majority culture leader, cannot keep their culture and their social location and their experiences out of their understanding the Bible, Jesus, the gospel, the view of the church, and how you're supposed to live on a daily basis. And one of the most damaging problems of the colonial era in which we still live in North America is that we as majority culture Christians simply don't know how our culture and our experience is impacting those around us, but also uh, creating a law around us as the do's and don'ts of being a majority culture person. So I don't pretend to know how to bracket my biases and, and for sure keep all the bad things out of what I think and believe in my culture, my social location, but it's something I'm striving for as I'm being sanctified in Jesus. And this is something I bring in with me willingly and knowingly into this podcast. So this is who I am. This is We the Peace, and I'd be honored to have you journey with us.